Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to Christy Ang. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Okay. Uh, how was your trip here? It was good. I heard actually your first store was around this area, it right? It's just opposite here. here. Okay, really? Yes. Oh, no wonder you you had no problem coming. Yeah, this this area uh, brings back sweet memories. Really? Yes. That's good. Yeah. Why sweet memories? Well, um, this was our. Um, we started this Damansara Uptown. I think just right opposite Lions Bank. Yeah. That's where my first office was. So we moved in there uh, mid 2012. Mid 2012. July. Yeah. So. Okay. And uh, so. To bring back a little bit of the story, uh, I find it great that you call it Sweet Memories because I know that it's a bittersweet start whenever it's at a company. <laughs> yes, it's, it's bittersweet, filled with challenges, but um, it's a decision I never regret since, uh, from day one. Something that I um, hold very closely to my heart. It's been tough, but it's been a very, very rewarding journey. Mm -hmm. mm. So tell us a little bit about uh, how did you get started with Christian.com? First of all, why shoes? First of all, uh, yeah, I'm a shoe addict. Uh, okay, and uh, I have a lot of I have a lot of shoes. Personally, I own more than 150 pairs. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and uh, why I like high heels? Because I used to have a very very tall and handsome boyfriend back then. Last okay. time. And yeah. Now? So and I was very short. So I wanted to you know boost up my height. So I like. So I look good next to him. Okay. So it was very superficial and very uh, very shallow. Yeah. So that's why that's how my look. I mean that's why I like high heels. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So and how did that come into a business? What were you doing by the time you decided to start a company? <clears throat> I never imagined. Um, you know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, deep in my heart, you know. I always wanted to, you know, be a businesswoman because it sounds, you know, it's good and it sounds glamorous. But I never imagined that um, what I'd started at, uh, what I did <clears throat> back then as a hobby, this, this shoe thing started out as a hobby. I never imagined it going this far. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it's a series of serendipitous events uh, since I started till today. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, coinc a lot of things happen by coincidence and all the things that happened led to where I am today. Yeah. But uh, for example, did you? Um, how did you start designing shoes? Okay. Um, it all started when I was in um, in varsity. Okay. So I was doing a degree in bio. I was doing a degree in biotechnology. So my parents, being brought raised in a very typical Asian household, uh, my mom and dad were like, "Oh, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be an engineer." So that was the kind of upbringing I had. Very, very competitive, you know. And I knew that, you know, I love shoes. I love design. And you know, deep in my heart, you know, I, I always dreamed like, of having like a like a shoe business. You know, something that I I'm very passionate about. But because of my my upbringing, you know, I had to do a professional course, or not, I'll piss my parents off, mm. like mad. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my parents always say that, you know, if you become a if you become a shoe designer or some fashion designer or whatever, sure die lah. No future. Yeah. So that's the a lot of uh, stigma. So did you actually mention to them you had this dream? Um, it was an interest. So <clears throat> what happened was I I went on a holiday with a bunch of friends to okay. southern part of Thailand, Hat Yai with a group of friends la, up, uh, during my varsity day. So, so I was roaming around the, the, the markets in Hat Yai and um, I, I, I befriended a lot of local uh, Thai girls there mm. through the introduction of some friends. And um, so I said, hey, where's the best place to go shopping? So they brought me to this huge shoe market you know, where it's a huge area and uh, Every store was shoes. Yeah, so that's how I first, um, you know, uh, I said, and how much are these shoes? 10 ringgit, 9 ringgit. Wow. And you could get the same thing here for like 50 ringgit. You know? So immediately, you know, I can, you know, wow. 
got some money sound already, you know, I can, you know, I can say, oh, okay, I can make some money out of ka-ching, you know. So that was like the aha moment for me, yeah. And so I bought tons of shoes. I bought like 20 pairs because they were so cheap. Okay. So I brought it back to KL and then all my friends say, wow, your shoe's so nice, your shoe's so nice. Okay, I'll sell it to you lah, you know. Okay. And so that's how I really started, you know. I mean, that's, oh, nice. yeah, that was the very, very, um, that's how the idea was seeded into my mind. How old are you? That time I was 18. 18, amazing. Yeah. I was gonna ask you exactly uh -huh. why your own brand, how did you come up with, okay, I will design shoes and I will build my own brand instead of reselling what, basically what you did there? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so, so after that I started, uh, mm. you know, I had a reason to go back to Thailand every month because I was fielding, uh, loading that's up a, my... That's a good reason. Thing, so. <laughs> yeah, I was loading up my friend's estima with like full of shoes, you know. Yeah. And he was like, oh, mom, I'm going to uh, Thailand with Christy. Why are you going to Thailand? Do what that? Tell me the truth. What are you going to do there in Thailand, huh? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm going for a business trip with Christy, you know. We want to go and check out the shoe market there and then we are going to sell it in the flea market here in Malaysia. So I used to, so every month I will go down to Hat, Hat Yai and load up the whole car with shoes. Okay. Yeah, and my friend, he would go and have his fun and then I would go and like look at the shoes. <laughs> so that's really how it started. So I, we transport all the shoes back to the curve and then we rented like a really cheap booth. Lah in the flea market. So that's mm -hmm. how I started. So I paid like 100 ringgit rent. I got all my guy friends to carry all the shoes and display them. So that we'll sit underneath the umbrella, the, the small little tent, and then we'll wait for customers to buy. Oh yeah, but it was good back then, you know. Um, we, could, we could like, uh, it was like a two, three thousand ringgit uh, collection a day. Wow. Yeah, at Curve. It was during the prime time where the flea markets were very, very busy and there, were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of patronage. So how are the margins you had back then? The margins? Yeah. I think it's about 500 percent. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's it's actually by chance because my friend, he uh, he desperately wanted to go to Hat Yai every month. And I I wanted to go there to shop. So it was like a very, very convenient relationship. <laughs> so we went to Hat Yai every month and and then he said, I don't care about the profits that you make. I just want to go to Hat Yai and I want to take my mother's car. So you go and talk to my mother. I said, okay, whatever. Okay. <laughs> So uh, it, that went on until I graduated. Oh my god! So I so it's so I sort of like I did that for about a year and a half. So I had some, the money sort of snowball, you know. I had a lot of profits because that time not many people were doing it. I think I was very lucky to have entered into that venture at a very, uh, very very uh, good time because not many people were doing were were like taking shoes from Thailand and selling it here at that point of time back then in I think about two thousand and eight. 2007 or that period. They were and what was special about these shoes? Why did you find it like so good to sell? Why people, did people buy it? Because um, the cost was very cheap yeah. and I was able to sell it relatively cheap here. So I buy example for 10 ringgit, I sell for 50 ringgit. It's relatively cheap for Malaysian people. So uh, I saw an opportunity, you know, because not many people were doing that. So it was just <clears throat> by chance. And yeah, and how to answer your question, so I continued doing that till I graduated from Varsity. And at that time, a lot of people were going to Thailand and taking stock back and selling the flea market. So it started getting saturated. A lot of people were taking back the same stock and selling it in the flea market. So I said, I said to myself, I need to take things to the next level. You know, I can't be selling the exact same shoes, the exact same stock as what all the other vendors are selling. So, so through, throughout the years, I fostered very, very good relationship with uh, all the sh shoe sellers there. And uh, some of them owned factories. And some of them have became close personal friends. So I think, um, I think at that time I was quick enough to build relationships, build trust mm -hmm. between the factory people. I mean, the people who worked in the factory, the shoe factories. And um, so I, <clears throat> when, when I graduated, I, I decided, okay, I, I, I spoke to a few factories and I said, hey, I can't be selling this because everyone in Malaysia is selling the same thing, you know, I, I, need, to, I need to stand out. So uh, then the factory owner said to me, oh, Christy, why don't you design yourself and we'll make it for you? That's how, actually, you know, it's, um, I wouldn't, it, you know, I mean, my whole business, like, it's not like one day I woke up from sleep, then I, oh, okay, I want to sell shoes. It didn't happen like that, you know, it was a series of events. Because I believe that um, great ideas, right, it takes years to conceptualize, you know. You don't just get like a good idea, like all of a sudden, you know. So I went through that whole process and um, 
so I started to, um, I started to hang out a lot in shoe factories. Started to befriend all the shoemakers, the artisans. You know, we just like friends. In Thailand, you know? in Malaysia, where? In Thailand, in at Thailand. first, yeah, mm -hmm. because the labor cost there is cheap. Mm. Yeah, so and I took all the opportunity to learn. Um, through observation. I have never studied design. I did a degree in biotechnology. Mm -hmm. No experience in making shoes, no experience in fashion. Whatever I did, <laughs> yeah. seriously, no experience at all. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you exactly like, uh -huh. um, how did you learn on the process of starting a business? So, from this first phase where you would buy shoes and resell it, what, what were the key learnings that you had that were fundamental for your success? You have to be very daring. <laughs> you have to be very daring. You know, I used to smuggle those shoes, like cross the border, hide it underneath the estima seat. <laughs> That's not good, Christy. <laughs> okay, it's not. It's not good. But you know, I. It, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. You know, I don't do that anymore. But I mean, I, being a very, very honest, yeah. So that's how I started. You know, when you have no money, and then I was like, oh, desperate. Yeah, need to do it. Okay. <laughs> then, uh, yeah. So I. That's how I started, and uh, selling and selling and selling in the flea market. So the money snowballed. So eventually, I um, befriended all the manufacturers mm -hmm. and I secured my own production line. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that time, my parents said to me, "Oh, you just graduated. Go and be a useful human being. You see, <laughs> her, my my. You see your cousin working in this big MNC company. Wow, your this cousin, wow, so successful. Your friend, my neighbor's daughter, doing very well. Wow, high high flying salary. Blah blah blah. And it was very competitive. Bring brought up in the Asian family, and um, okay, go work for a Swiss pharmaceutical." You know, because my parents will only be impressed if they hear big names, you know. <laughs> so I went work, I signed up as a professional medical representative. I was a, a legalized drug pusher okay. in a Swiss pharmaceutical company in, in, in PJ. So I worked there and um, yeah, so I started my job uh, as a medical rep, okay, and... Uh, Basically, we're selling medicine, what did you do? Drug pushing. I mean, drug pushing. yeah, I'll go to all the hospitals and I'll see all the doctors and I'll be like, hi, doctor, I want to buy some drugs or not? Oh, this is very good for your patient. So that's basically, I was a sales girl, you know. Yeah. And I think that experience is really, really crucial because that's my first job, my first real job. Like, okay. Yeah. Before that, I've never worked like uh, full time anywhere. Mm -hmm. So after I graduated, I worked in um, that pharmaceutical company for two years. Yeah. Okay, so in between, I said, oh, I can't be like Monday to Friday selling drugs to doctors and then Saturday and Sunday, I go flea market, cannot, you know, what if my boss see me in the flea market, die, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, so it was, oh, I mean, this is the true story, you know, it, it, it didn't happen overnight, it's like all these events yeah. that led up to where I am. And I said, okay, what's the best way? I, one night, you know, I asked my friend, hey, what's the best way to do this shoe thing? Uh? Because profit very good, uh? what's the best way to do it? Uh? Uh, without my boss catching me, okay, and without you know, you know, I know it's bad lah, but it's the truth. <laughs> yeah, you know, and because when you work for someone, you're obligated. Yeah. You can't have like you can't like I work for this company at night. I go and do something part time. Yeah. It doesn't sound good, you know. So my friend said, "Hi, I know lah. Start a website lah. Okay, okay, let's start a website. Okay. <laughs> so that's how it really started. And my name is Christina Ng. Okay, and um, I put the name Christy Ng so my boss don't know, you know, in case he. <laughs> <laughs> the truth you know uh, <laughs> everything you know I was like masterminding you know say um, okay so when someone calls me and say hey can I speak to Christy ah oh, that shoe shoe customer oh hi is this Christina oh doctor calling oh, yes yes doctor <laughs> yes doctor how can I help you so <laughs> this is the truth you have double personality double agent yeah no choice because desperate at that time serious okay. because I started off with no money I don't have like a rich dad you know my father not printing money you know with photostat machine you know, I had very very, very little resources. Yeah, you worked since you were 12, correct? Yeah, those were like gigs, you know. Um, like when I was 12, I sold flowers. Like my mom used to like have this craze making all the straw flowers and everything. So I like, my mom like, hey, why don't you take my flower, right? You look young and cute. Go to the LRT station there and like try to sell it. Now I'll stand there, you know, and, and, it, I, and I can like sell like maybe three or four small little you pots make, of like, flowers. You make like and people buy the flowers. Yeah, me and my brother, we will stand by the LRT station. Yeah, so that's what I used to do. So I think that sort of like um, spurred my um, interest for business. You know, I started very young, you know, yeah. 12 years old, I was selling flowers. And there was one day a guy gave, I, I wanted to sell a bunch of, uh, a, a small little pot of uh, straw flowers for like 10 bucks. And the guy said, oh, I'll give you 50 bucks. Oh, 
take the money, go back home very happy. Mm. So I think from that day, I know that I really, I you know I have the drive to make money. Not that I, I mean, not that I'm like a hundred percent money face lah, but I love money lah. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's how. I mean, uh, in a good way, it sort of inspired me. I mean, my yeah. my younger day experiences. I know it sounds. I sound like a very bad person, but I mean, I mean, this is. I mean, I didn't cheat anyone. No, he. People willing to willing buyer willing seller, you know, and so that sort of like s stirred my interest for business. But that's actually really interesting. You uh -huh. can see actually how the experience you had that were very practical gave you that insight that oh, people want to give money yeah. for something, and I can actually build something and give value to them and yes. get money back. Exactly. So I think many people don't get this sense when we are just going to school and studying. We don't get this learning. Because in school, your teachers don't teach you how to make money. They just yeah. teach you how to pass exams. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> and um, so you work in several part-time jobs and... Yeah, I did a lot of part-time jobs because my dad would give me like maybe five bucks a day, something like that. So I, I only can spend within that five bucks. And I was very greedy, you know. I went to the... I go to the bookstore and I buy all the Sailor Moon cards and like five dollars cannot... I know for a fact that five bucks cannot buy the whole, sh whole deck of Sailor Moon cards. So I have to be very resourceful. So I said to my mom, I said, Mommy, I want the whole... I want everything. Man, dude, it's so greedy. Yeah. You don't even make money spend like mad. How, 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 like that? You know, that kind of thing. So, if you want anything, you, if you want anything, any luxury, do it yourself. Make your own money. Pay your own bills. This is an adult. Or not, you don't talk to me. You know, like, like, you know my mom's yeah. like, if you want, you want to buy this, fine. Pay yourself. Don't ask me for money. So, I was brought up in that kind of environment. Interesting, because yeah. your parents... Uh, were very meaningful for you as well. They challenged you to follow a traditional career, but at the same time, accidentally yeah. or not, pay yourself. Yeah, they pushed you to very and sell flowers, and these were very interesting experience. Very interesting experience. And my mother is very competitive. You know, when I was younger, like um, like five six years old, she would force me, you know, to join all those coloring contests because she wants to win the hamper. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, she's she. I think I would I would like I think. Uh, I have to thank her for the amazing um, parental <laughs> upbringing. I mean, you know, when I was young, she was like, oh, this coloring contest in Atria Shopping Center, hmm, the price is 300 ringgit hamper. My God, go and join. Yeah, oh, okay. And I'd be like, oh, the one. You go, you go, you go and join. I don't care, you color it and, and you know. And then I'll be, me, I'll be like coloring and then she'll be like standing next to me and shout, Shading, shading, outline, outline. She'll be shouting at me, you know, like, color finish faster, five minutes left. Oh no, you cannot win, you know. And so she brought me up in a very, very, very competitively. And like every single drawing contest, my mother would sign me up. She dragged me out of bed Saturday morning, forced me to go to that whatever shopping mall and color there. Then she sharpened oh my all God. my col color pencils and said, you better color nicely later. Shading, uh, shading, outline, outline. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you basically saw the fact that you could get value in the form of money out of something that you did. And then you went to Thailand and you found that you could resell shoes. And then you found that doing your own design would actually be more profitable than buying other people's shoes. So how... When did actually you do your first design? How was the experience of designing your first shoe and selling it? How okay. did it happen? Um, before this, I was very lazy. You know, my brain like sleeping every day. When I just think of money, 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 money every day, lah. Okay, but then when when you know the flea market, more and more people started selling the same product. I knew that if I do not get creative, I will lose out. So that's when I went the extra mile. I went and um, you know I went to I went and learn. You know. Um, learn from uh, my mentors or the senior shoemakers i actually learned and who are um, your mentors um just a bunch of uh, ordinary people um i think some of them are like 60 70 can be my grandfather already some of them yeah be nice to them befriend them and you just learn and learn and learn and be you know um just be I, I made I forced myself to be a very teachable person you not know, be, to be to humble myself you know to to put myself on the ground, like people step on me, so I just just take the pain, you know, and learn and learn. So it's a very, it's a, you know, at first when I went to all the factories, I said, hey, I need to come up with my own shoe line, and this is my design. Can you make it for me? Can one thousand pairs lah? Oh damn, shit! How do I get that kind of money to make one thousand pairs for one design? There's always a minimum order quantity. I think a lot of people in the retail will know will know what I'm what I mean. Yeah. 
So I went begging one factory by one factory, please lah, boss, Ay, help me lah, help me lah. I don't have money to do 1,000 pairs, help me. You know, it was, it, it was so, I know it's so pathetic, no, but seriously, and I, I, and I went like factory to factory, I said, please lah, help me lah, help me lah. I don't have money, you know. Um, can you help me make just like 10 pairs? 10 pairs, are you wasting my time? My sliver also cannot cover 10 pairs, you know? So it was a lot of uh, convincing, you know? And one day, right, um, I was so persistent, you know? I kept on, like, you know, being a pain in one of the factory bosses' ass, like, you know? Just every day bugging him and bugging him and bugging him, come to his office, buying things for him, la, talk. And then, uh, and then his wife, very, very fierce. His wife, like, gangster. Like, talk, sweet talk her every day, say all sorts of nice things to her. Like, kowtow to her like maximum level and then one day she called me up and said Christy I think I will help you uh, that was the day where you know I started my shoe line it was a lot of begging seriously when you have no money and you have no reputation and you're starting you're starting from literally zero you know no one knows who you are no one trusts you you know if I supply to you and you don't pay me how yeah. you know everyone has that fear you know especially when you're a startup so I went door to door begging people until one person uh, one factory owner said, okay, I think I will help you. I think I will do it for you. And they did it saying, like, as for a help. They did it because of the relationship you built with them. The relationship, and also because they pity me at that time. Because very pathetic. <laughs> That's what I think, la, you know. And I said, I Let's never get met. rid of this girl. <laughs> yeah, I said, I never met a girl, la, you know, your age, la, so, so adamant, no, so persistent, so much tenacity to every damn day messaging me. I'm so annoyed at you. But never mind, I just do for you. La. I, 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 um, I will just do you. I am fed up. La, you know? You know, it came to a point. I you know, said, usually I, I will kick you out of my factory. Uh, oh, help me, la, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then he felt I was very serious. I think he could, see, he could feel my sincerity and uh, he could feel that I was very, very serious about the business. Mm. So uh, in July 2010, I, um, with the help of uh, that factory, I made eight designs. Yes, that's how I started. So I had a friend, uh, one handsome guy. I said, hey, can you help me take picture? Uh, huh? Make it look branded like Louis Vuitton. Can I? Uh? He said, okay, 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 I'll help you take picture. Then he took photographs of that eight designs which I made uh, with white background and he edit, edit, you know, make the picture look very expensive. Then I loaded it up on my website and on my Facebook. That's how I started. Wow. And how did it go when you uploaded it? What happened? And I uploaded it. Uh, I put my phone number there. No, I put my website because I use a simple WordPress blog and it mm. was free. And then I used like free plugin. I was very cheapskate like, back then. You know, I'll be nice to you because I need you to like take picture for me or like, you know, that kind of thing like free. Ma, you know? Then I buy, oh, God, Blanja, you eat, like, help me take picture. Because you know? like, when you have nothing, you have to be very resourceful. So you have to look through your phone book, see which friends can help you. Then you ask for help. Like. I think that was the first thing that I did when I started my business. Awesome. Mm. And um, so how did it grow? How did it happen that within a month, you increased your f fans database okay. to like thousands? Okay, I think um, at that time when I started on Facebook, uh, Facebook was not so expensive. Everything was very cheap. Now ads, right, you buy until you cry, you know, so expensive. But back then, when I started in 2010, it was much, much cheaper. Seriously, it was much cheaper than now. Now it's much more expensive. So. Um, when I loaded up that eight pictures, they're very beautiful. So I loaded it on my Facebook. So all my shopaholic girlfriends started, you know, sharing the picture. So it went viral mm. because I think at that point of time, I did because I was I I did five inch heels that time. The eight designs were all five inch heels, and at that point of time, right, um, <clears throat> shops like Vinci, Guess, Aldo, they don't sell five inch heels. That period, yeah, it was always the three inch or the four inch. And then I went, I did something really, really unique, five inch. So I think people were intrigued because they've never seen like those kind of heels that I made. They're very, very special because I made them overseas. Yeah. So I think uh, the product was very unique and I was very confident with that eight designs that I did. Um, the colors were, you know, they're very vibrant. They're very colorful shoes and they were shoes that you cannot buy in any department store in Malaysia. So I think that's why I gained a lot of traction during the early stage. And I think within a couple, then the, after the next day, after I loaded up the eight designs, my phone ringing off the hook, you know. Yeah. Off the hook, where, uh, where is your place? Uh, where can I buy the shoe? Okay, okay, you meet me at Klana Jaya LRT station. You bring money, uh, I will pass you the shoe at the LRT station. So that's how I got my first sale. It's like From drug dealing. Total, total stranger, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And um, so I see, it's funny because everything was 
coincidence, accidental or yes. coincidence on how yeah. you started online. Yeah, I wasn't using much brain power that time. Seriously, to be frank with you, I think it uh, only recent years only I start to think mm -hmm. more. You know, probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what? Um, so is, you started a business online, and uh -huh. when did you find the need of growing into a physical store, and why? Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that time, people calling me left and right, meeting LRT station, Centerpoint, McDonald's, bus stop, Shell station, Caltex, everywhere. I'm like meeting all over the place, you know, seriously. And were you alone or did you have people in your team? Depends lah. Sometimes I go alone, sometimes I force my mother to go. Oh. <laughs> my mother, she will go and then she will just bring her hand and say, Mother, don't bring any money, uh, later you get robbed. Then she will just wait at the LT station with her handphone. Then the person message, okay, what car are you driving? And uh, I will like pass the shoe to you. Then my mother, hey, you got to bring money, uh, make sure you pay me. Uh. Then, then if you pay, my mother count, then only we give the shoe to them. Okay. <laughs> So those those are those are very fond memories. And when I think back, I keep laughing because this is how stupid I do things last time. I mm. just keep laughing, you know. Yeah, yeah but that's fun. And um, so yeah, but uh, how did you find the need of? When did you find the need of going to a store? And also, when did you find the conditions of going to a store? Okay, so uh, all this thing, I mean, physical the, store. The, the, the office that we have in Jaya One, it didn't happen magically overnight. There was a lot of hard work. Truth is, there's a lot of hard work behind whatever you see now, <clears throat> and all the money it didn't, you know, not sugar daddy give like, you know, it came from hard work like, you know. So, so uh, from 2000. Had no investors, right? Uh, no, the, okay. the company is uh, fully owned, uh, privately owned by myself. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So then, um, in 2000, uh, yeah. So I, I did like that. Then my mother is like flying everywhere. So I said, okay, must install some kind of shopping cart so they can, we can automate the process. So, so it started like that. So after that, mm -hmm. I uh, installed a free WordPress plugin. And then the orders grew and grew and grew. And then we have to have two, three handphones to answer all the calls. And then we have to reply SMS. Midnight also replying SMS. Okay, bang into this account. So this is damn stupid the way you do things. My friend said, okay, okay, let's get a... Let's pay uh, like a developer and build like a proper website where we can like automate the payment, got payment gateway. So all these things, uh, it happened because the orders were going up. So we we felt a uh, urgent need to you know uh, improve our infrastructure. So we had we then I was very then that time okay uh, I looked for the cheapest software developer. I mean the ch cheapest programmer and to make the cheapest website lah. Cause stingy and don't have much money last time. But that's a big mistake. Don't be. I, I, in hindsight, right, waste a lot of money being cheapo last time. So now, if you want something done well, pay good money. I changed lah. If you know me back then, like five years ago, you know how cheapo I am. But then now, very different. Now I pay good money because um, for important things like infrastructure, like you know your website, you know the 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 people behind it, you have to pay good money because if you pay peanuts, you get donkeys. That's that's what I I, I learned this the hard way. You know, last time. I mean, don't have money, you know, have to start from scratch. Every dollar counts, you know. Even now, uh, I tell you, email blast or so, uh, we do manual one last time. Damn stupid, I tell you. Even, <laughs> even the f <laughs> SMS, uh, oh, SMS blast is very expensive. I asked my, my, my neighbor to send WhatsApp, group broadcast, cheap, free, ma, WhatsApp, use Wi-Fi. <laughs> so I do all these stupid things, you know, I tell you. Because at the time, no money at all, you know. So I think after a while, it... Um, when the sales got better, I hired professionals, okay, and uh, the first person I hired wasn't, I think he met my needs at that point of time, because I didn't have much money, I paid him like maybe $6,000 for a website, but it's crap, like if you, $6,000 cannot get you anywhere. I think a good website today would cost at least five digits, uh, a proper e-commerce website, a good mm -hmm. one uh, with good companies supporting you. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to outsource your development, outsource your shopping cart, you need to have a very good company uh, yeah. supporting you. I think that's very important for my business, for e-commerce. So if you're doing an e-commerce business, I think uh, that's number one on your priority list. Get a very reliable person. And yeah. should this person be part of your team or should this person be anyone you hire and pay for the service? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, it depends on your level of competency. Like for myself, I, I do not come from a programming background. Okay, Though I know one or two programming languages, but it's not sufficient to like build what we are using now. So I had to outsource because for me, outsourcing is cheaper. Okay, so it depends on what 
what type of business you're doing and whether it makes more economic sense to, you know, to, um, to outsource or to have the developers in-house. It really depends on your business model. Every business is different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know that for investors, many times it matters. They ask that the developer is part of your team. But I agree with you that maybe if you, but as an e-commerce, you need constantly maybe to be revamping, checking for bugs. So do you have, how do you have your developers now? Do you have someone who's part of your team? Um, currently, my development is still fully outsourced, mm -hmm. uh, but the company that's handling it is very, very reliable. I can call them midnight or so. I mean, they, so far the people who are handling my site, they are very, very competent okay. at this point of time. I think for me, I, I prefer, it depends on you, you know, it depends how, how much you know about all this tech stuff and things like that. If you feel, because for me, I know my strength is in product, my strength is in product development, my strength is in design, my strength is in marketing, marketing and the big picture. So I leave, I, 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 decide, I decided, based on my situation, I decided to outsource this bit of the business. So it really depends on you and where you should know where your strengths are. Like for me, I know my strength is not there. So I'd rather pay good money to a very smart person to run it for me. And that person won't disappoint me. That's how I, pref that's how I run my show currently. And uh, it's very interesting because one of your biggest markets, like your biggest market of, cons of consumers are in the US, right? Yes. How did it come up? How did it happen? It's a very long story, but I'll <laughs> summarize later. Everyone yeah. fall asleep. Um, basically, uh, I received an email, I think about in July 2012, mm -hmm. when I just moved into this office. Mm -hmm. Okay, before this, it was doing for my house, no stuff, only me, my mother, two women show, you know. Okay. Yeah, so in July 2012, I gather my courage, gather my balls already, right? Then move into Uptown, cheapest rental, 2,000 bucks. So that's how I, and I hired my first staff, who is actually my shoe customer. She said, oh, I have nothing to do. Every day, so I come here and buy shoes, spending money. Hey, you come and help me work, lah. Part-time can ah. Okay lah, okay lah. End up work until two years. Yeah, my first staff. So, yeah, it's amazing. Um, I didn't even advertise. I just hired my, st uh, my a customer. So, we moved into Damansara Uptown. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, that time I wasn't using my brains again. Okay, I go and pick an office ah, two floors up, no elevator. Isn't that, how dumb can I be? Really, I, I mean, I'm saying all this thing now because I reflect, ah, oh, very stupid ah, the way I do things. I hope to share how stupid I was, <laughs> so you don't follow the same path, it's really dumb. So I... No, so you commit mistakes and see it's okay. And we carry 1,000 pairs of shoes up and down, two fleets wow. of stairs in Damansara, up down this cheap shop lot here, oh my god, really dumb. Because cheapskate, wanted to save money, no money, so that, that place cheap, $2,000, okay, rent there, you know. But we have to carry, you no know, me and her, plus my Filipino mate, Okay, carry the shoe up every day. Really dumb, I tell you. I'm surprised we're still alive. Oh, thank God, thank God. Back haven't break yet. It was stupid, you know, you know the shop lots. I was just on top of Guardian. Two floors up. Okay, so we carry the shoes up every morning, no parking. Uptown is like parking. You can't find parking uptown during uh, working hours. Cannot find parking, always double park. Car give MPPJ toll. Never think of all these consequences, you know. Just one cheap, 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 you know. Cheap rent, cheap staff, hire mate, this and that, you know. It's <laughs> so I learned through all these mistakes, uh, but it worked for us. Uh, within that two years, we grew the business from like, we grew the business like tenfold, I think, since we moved into the shop lot. Wow. Yes. Uh, when, when I started, we are... We're just doing like a couple of thousands a month, but now we're, we are in the million dollar sales revenue in a year. We're doing above, we're doing six digits uh, now. Wow. Yes. Started from LRT station, meet people by the roadside until today. <laughs> yeah. Very lucky, very, very lucky. Uh, a lot of mistakes I made, I never think, you know. I think I would like to say this, you know, don't stinge on your accountant, get a very, very good tax officer because I tell you, uh, the, thing that, the things that happen to me, uh, I'm surprised I still got hair on my head. Seriously, a lot of, a lot of really terrible things happen to me. Uh. A lot, a lot of funny, funny. So get a good tax officer, tax agent. Get a, you know, do your keep your books properly. Because when I started, right, nobody teach me, you know, in school. So I never learned accounts. Receipt thrown in the dustbin, you know. Uh, so be careful. <laughs> File everything nicely, you know. 
But a lot of startups, right, you, you will overlook this one, trust me. Your, so your mind is like all sucked into making money. Oh, I want to grow my business, grow my customer base, grow profits, improve my product, improve my website. You forgot about bookkeeping. You forgot about yeah. very, very important. And especially this year, you have GST coming up in Pro. We are prepared. <laughs> From past experience, I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you must have a good dedicated bookkeeper. Mm. Last time I, I so stingy, right? Don't even want to hire like admin. You know, I, I did all the stapling and filing. Don't do like that. Like. And I hired the cheapest accountant. Don't do that also. Get a good chartered accountant with a good tax agent and then make sure you file everything nicely. Your checks, you photostat every damn check. Seriously. Okay. Yeah. So learn is get a good developer, a good accountant. <laughs> yeah, a good website developer. If you know if you do not know nuts about you do not know much about web development, um Pay a good developer. I can recommend you some if you want, depending on your budget. There are, I think we 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 know a few so our, our, within yeah. our circle. Yeah, but developers are also good to recommend. So anyone who's looking for developers, <laughs> yeah, good <laughs> point. So I still I want to start wrapping up my round of questions because I want to give it to the floor, but uh, time passes by really fast. But I have lots of questions to ask you, actually. I will prioritize and ask you about that. So growing a global business, and I was reading about you, and the guys from the 2013 SME Challenge from Alliance Bank, they said they were impressed by how scalable you made your business. Uh, oh, OK. It was uh, at the star. <laughs> OK, so you can give it the references later. So. Uh, that word stuck, got stuck in my mind, like scalability yes. on a business that involves manufacturing and product, pro design, manufacturing, like everything that would make it not scalable. So how did you come up with a scalable model and how do you make it scalable? Because of all that mistakes that I made, which I told you just now, I made, it's a real, you know, bang the wall, we make so much mistakes, right? You learn the hard way. So from all these mistakes that I made, you know, I know that I have to make sure that my business is scalable, or not. You know, or not. You'll be doing the same revenue year after year. You know. So um, how did I scale? How do I scale? Uh? Um, I learn from my mistakes, and I try to automate as many processes as I can. You know, I um, I ask myself, how can I uh, enable my business to to, you know, for, let's say process, from processing 10 orders a day to 1,000 orders a day, I ask myself, how can I do it? So I work backwards from there, you know, uh, improve my infrastructure, improve my website, my, pay, uh, my payment system, make it very easy for customers to check out. Uh, make, uh, how do I get more people to discover my website and make a purchase decision? So I work backwards, you know, I knew where I wanted to go and I worked backwards. A lot of hard work, it's not overnight, made tons of mistakes, Burn a lot of money, made a lot of mistakes, a lot of tears, a lot of regrets, but a lot. But it's been very, very rewarding because once you make a mistake, right? Because I'm the type of person uh, I have to garner first. Only I learn one. This stubborn attitude, like I always think I'm very smart. Don't listen to advice. That kind of behavior, like, you know. So, yeah. So after I made all the mistakes, I start to learn how to scale. You know, I the, I spend good money. On infrastructure, I think number one infrastructure is very very important, because since I moved from this, have to carry the shoes two floors up to my a much bigger place in Jaya One with lift, I think I got a big difference. You know, last time my staff right, I really need to thank them like, because they're willing to carry the shoe two floors up. <laughs> but now we have a lift. I mean, just basics. I mean, I use this as an illustration because that's how how small things like that will actually affect your business, you know, the convenience. You know, now I, have, I, I make sure that I don't stinge. Every staff has a season parking. I want to make it very easy, small things like that, make it very convenient. Everything, pay, pay good money. And like, um, when you want to scale, you need money. This is a fact. You, know, you cannot stinge and you need to spend at the right places, like infrastructure, hire the right people. Very, very important. The, the team that you work with, you need to hire smart people. Yeah? Um, you also need to learn how to do effective marketing. Like for, for me, I'm selling a product. You need to think of the cheapest way, the best way to get the message across to, you know, you have to be very, very creative. And how yeah. do you do that? Um, have to find lubang everywhere, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have, you have to be on the lookout for opportunities. Um, and your product, 
I think um, we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't be able to sell so many pairs of shoes if our product wasn't good. So I think our product is a really really good product. Uh, that's why a lot of people got to know about it by word of mouth. Uh, we spend a decent amount on advertisement, Facebook ads, Google ads. Um, we give shoes away to magazines, so we we have, we've we have vouchers today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, we we spend uh, we spend uh, our money um, like whatever profits we make, we prioritize on like um, improving the product. Like we allocate the funds to like um, improve the product, expand the product range for advertisements for human resource. So I think you got to plan, you no, know, um, based on how much money you have. Uh. So basically, infrastructure having paying for a great team the amount of money that they deserve and um automation you mentioned uh, automating making effective process as well i think uh, i'm still to be honest with you i'm still working on the processes my i run my business a bit like china man 100 percent china man but uh i'm learning you know learning how to improve things to automate more and more processes so it's there's no book to teach you how to automate a business or scale up. There's no like, there's no book, there's no manual for it. A lot of it, it's through experience, test and test and test. So if this method doesn't work, it's like cooking. You know, you put in the wrong ingredients. The next round, you improve and you improve and you improve until you get the perfect recipe. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And my final question goes to: Given the fact you have a big pool of customers in the U.S. in Hong Kong. What's the main difference that you notice from the Southeast Asian or Malaysian market and this market outside overseas? Okay, that's sad to say. La. Malaysians only want to buy cheap shoes. The cheaper, the better. When we sell 20 ringgit shoes, wow, the website can crash. You know, seriously, silver out of memory. Yes, seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you see, yeah, this is the problem in Malaysia. So uh, <laughs> they like to buy cheap shoes. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas our clientele in the US, they are more willing to spend. Uh, our average customer in the US spends at least 160 US dollars per basket with us. Yes, that's very, very high because uh, we do wedding shoes and a lot of them, I think we found our strength. Um, we really, uh, through all my experimentation, a lot of failures and successes, I realized that we're very good at custom-made shoes and we're very good at wedding shoes. These are the two things that we excel in. Yeah, so, um, how we started to grow our business in the States was, uh, you know, a lot of my our shoe images are very, because we spend a lot on photography, we place a lot of emphasis on, you know, because when you're selling online, it's just photo and words. Yeah. So pictures are everything. Do not sting on the photograph, you know. So a lot of our pictures are very well indexed. If you go to Google, you search wedding shoes, I can bet you the first page right there are our shoes there. There'll be our designs on Google image search. So I think uh, one... Very good tip. <laughs> the picture has to be very, very good. Uh, you have to know where to stinge and where to spend because this is a startup, right? So money is always sparse. If you have a billion dollars, you can spend on all the best things. But when you have very, very little money, you need to learn how to... It's a lot about instincts, you know. There, you have to like feel, okay, where should I gamble? Banker or player? Banker or player? You know, you got to like... <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's like that, you know. It's a lot of intuition. Yeah. And um, I told myself, okay, I should spend on the photographs because office look like crap, never like mind. Front people see, whoa, like very great like that, you know. So that's how I started. That's how I rationalized. So I spent a lot of um, a lot of my resources in taking very good photographs. So a lot of these pictures got indexed on Google. So there was this lady, uh, bride from North Carolina. So she was looking for nine pairs of shoes, one for herself and for eight bridesmaids. So she went around America, in, around North Carolina, shoe from shoe shop to shoe shop, and she wanted a, a very specific design, custom made in different heel heights. Because out of eight bridesmaids, one of them was six feet tall, the other bridesmaid was five feet tall. So she wanted that design made in a very specific color in different heel heights, so that in all the wedding photographs, all her bridesmaids will look similar in height and stature. OCD customer. OCD, seriously. <laughs> yeah, I know. So it's like, you know, for a girl, uh, when they want to get married, they become bridezillas. This one is like the, the top bridezilla of the world, uh, okay? She actually wrote us an email, you know? Oh, I saw your picture on Google Image, I uh, Google search, and your, I found you. Uh. I don't know where Malaysia is, but I know you can do it, you know? Yeah, I know. And I've seen your reviews on, because um, we sell on Etsy, we sell on Amazon. Apart from my website, we sell on a few marketplaces. So I saw your review on Amazon. Not bad, you know, because people write good things, you know, so they sort of trust this 
weird shoe label from don't know where, which country, but the reviews were good. You know, people are very practical you know, when they buy online. I realize a lot of Americans are very practical. They see your reviews. Okay, can trust. Okay, good, good review, I will buy, you know? So I saw your reviews, they were pretty good. And I think, can you do this? Can you custom made this design in different heel heights for my eight bridesmaids? Because I wanna, or during the picture, uh, during my wedding day, all of them must be same height. I said, okay, I'll do it for you, you pay me. How much? 160 US dollar per pair. Okay, I'll pay you. Because no shop in North Carolina could do it. You go to Gas, you go to Vinci, I mean, there's no Vinci there. You go to Aldo, Nine West. They, the mainstream shoe players, the shoe retailers do not cater for such demands. It's just not available in the global shoe marketplace, you know, customization. So I saw, you know, I saw this as an opportunity for myself. So I said, okay, I'll do it for you. You pay me 160 US dollars per pair because I knew I could charge premium. Because you, when you can't find something, you can charge higher. That's the way it is, you know. You know, I learned from my Thailand shoe experience, you know. See, a lot of things I learned from my previous experience, I know that I couldn't sell, because I, when, the, when the product is saturated, when everyone has the same product and everyone can do the same thing, the price would drop, there's no premium. So I saw a huge opportunity for custom-made shoes. I made the shoes for her in different heel heights. I sent it to her, she loved it. I have a picture. <laughs> same height? Yes. <laughs> Not exactly the same, but very similar in height. And she was so happy because the six feet girl looked closer to the five feet girl. And they're all wearing the same shoes. And she loved it. Mm. She loved it. It was, it was a really, really beautiful picture. So I have that picture framed up my, framed up my room. So that's the first time you customize? Um, I customized many times before, but it was the first time I had a Brightzilla from America. And I think since then, since then, um, you know, uh, it was a it was a big stepping stone. That that case that that case that I handled that nine pairs of shoes, it was a huge stepping stone for us because since then we had lots and lots of requests like that. Oh. So we started to cater for that sort of request. That's and, amazing. Uh, yeah. So it all happened by chance, and uh, and mm. we ship to America every day now. Uh, Forty percent of our portfolio is export. Wow. Mostly to America. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I get very inspired uh, when I see pictures like that. You know, I had this bride whose husband was uh, in the US military and he was posted off to, to some war zone in Iraq. And when he came back, he married her and we made the pair of shoes for her and she sent us a picture too. So, you know, it's stories like this that, you know, make me feel very satisfied. It gives me a great sense of joy and satisfaction. You know, I feel like, okay, I'm born in this world, not just to pay bills, but to, to offer something greater to humanity, you know? You know wow. if you <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And I can feel like uh, you're very inspired right now. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's just, it just feels great to, to see women all across the world look beautiful in our, pro in our products yeah. and to share like, a really, really happy moment with them, like their wedding. This is crazy because um, we could say this is, these are shoes, right? It's just shoes. And what you have behind is a lot of meaning behind the shoes you make and a lot of emotion. And I'm gonna compare it to the most cheesy entrepreneur I could ever compare, ever. Like, not compare, just remind. But when you recall the way Steve Jobs saw computers, he didn't see the machine that he worked on. He saw freedom and the power to create. So whoever sees a strong why behind a mere product, I always feel these are the people who excel and do crazy shit and people look at them and they don't understand maybe why they are successful. And of course, you're greedy and competitive and <laughs> all the skills you have in business and you like money, that's important. <laughs> but mainly seeing the why when you're doing shoes. Yes. It's not only about designing it yeah. and manufacturing. Yeah, um, you have to start with a passion. I mean, but of course, passion doesn't last if you don't see results. I mean, being, I'm being very frank here. You know, I think if I didn't see all these results, like, you know, all these brides thanking us, sending us photographs of their wedding day, wearing our products, you know, I've got like so many pictures of like French wedding, you know, by, you know, I've got this bride from Germany, uh, all sorts of weird places. We've got customers all over Europe. Okay, but mostly from America. And you know, when I see all these colorful people, you know, of different cultures and different races, you know, having really different types of wedding and you know, everyone's so happy in our products. I just feel I just feel like 
you know, I just feel very satisfied. It gives me a great sense of satisfaction. I think this is my real, it gives me real inspiration to keep on pushing the boundaries and be more and more creative to give my customers better value. Money is important because if you don't have money, die. Everything cannot do. This is a fact. But um, yeah, my customers give us the best ideas and the best inspiration. Most of our best ideas come from our customers because That's we great. listen to what they want. That's that's a great insight, actually. Okay, I have lots of things to take home, but I really want to give you guys the mic. I will keep asking her questions. So, for now, Christy, thank you very much for coming here. That's amazing. Uh, questions from the floor? Okay, come. Can you come here? Oh, yeah. oh you always ask questions, right? <laughs> and then you guys on this side can. Thank you. Hello. No. Okay. Come here. Come to, come to this side. Chrissy, well done on your journey. Um, amazing stuff. Um, two questions. Firstly, um, where to from here for Christy Young? Um, and, you know, how far more can you go? Um, you know, what can you do, etc. Second question is in terms of choice of manufacturing location, was there, besides, you know, chance, etc., have you considered other countries within the region besides Thailand? And, you know, how do they compare to you? Um, the first question was, where do we go from here? Okay, this year's objective is to grow. Uh, we had 100% growth last year from 2013 to 2014. So from 2014 to 2015, we also expect at least 100% growth at the very least. Um, Okay, that's, we'll keep on growing the business uh, as long as we are alive. 100% uh, keep on growing, try, la, try, la, die, die, just try, la, cannot say, cannot say die one, keep going, you know. Business is like that, you know. No matter what happens, just keep going. GSD coming, keep going, keep going, don't care, you know. Yeah, cannot pull handbrake. Uh, and then you asked me about manufacturing. Yeah, beginning I started using those Thai manufacturers because that was what I had at at that time, that was what's available. But later on, I took over a factory, a small production line. Uh, actually, you know, when, I know, because I know it sounds like a very, very uh, difficult task, very uphill task, you know, you don't know anything about shoes, you don't know anything about whatever, and you want to buy a factory. It sounds damn difficult, and I know you cannot imagine it in your brain, and there's no like formula to like, how do I buy a factory? How do I buy a manufacturing line? To be honest with you, I'm not lying. It just happened progressively, you know. Uh, at first, I ordered from Thailand, made the shoes there. Then everybody, oh, you know, the, the news was spread when everybody very busy body. Hey, that girl uh, got sales one. Every month, give me X amount of order. Then another guy uh, will be greedy. Ma. Then he'll come say, hey, Christy, I heard that you're giving this factory X amount of business this month. Why don't you give me some business to my factory or so? So eventually, I had I have a lot of manufacturers at one point of time. I even went all the, I have manufacturers in Thailand, in China, and also in Malaysia. And then uh, it just happened, um, one of the factories in Malaysia went bust, and then it came an opportunity for me to take over because there were people working there, really good artisans, really good workers, skilled people. And it came a chance where I could actually buy, buy over because the boss old already or the boss chop up or the boss stroke or whatever. There will come a chance. Seriously, this one, I'm not, I'm not, it just happened, you know, I didn't plan to like, oh, I want to own a, um, a manufacturing line. But what I do now is I have a group of artisans who are under my, who are, uh, who, who I'm paying for under my payroll, and I sort of let a kept like a auntie there, old lady manage everything lah. Yeah, so actually it happened because the previous guy went bust, so I had a ch opportunity to buy it at a cheap. So I think uh, the moral of the story here is sometimes I d I really didn't plan for all this, but I was very opportunistic. I see this guy, hmm, the Maria look like a financial difficulty, so keep some cash. Cash is king because when opportunities come, you buy it. Yeah, but it's, it's also good to outsource your manufacturing. Like for us until today, um, I don't want to put ev all, everything in one basket because one day if let's say Christy Ng shoes no sale, I have to pay all my staff, you know, and I have to take care of them. I have to make sure they get paid. So it's good to uh, don't put all your eggs in basket, outsource some work because money you cannot make finish one. You have to let other people make also sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I outsource to China, to reliable people there and, and uh, I've got 
uh, manufacturers in China and Thailand, and also my own production line in in Malaysia. The custom-made shoes are made uh, with in-house, my own people, and the certain certain product lines, the cheaper ones, to make it at a very cost-effective price, are outsourced to China. Amazing. Okay. It's interesting because, in a way, I like to see one of the ways I think entrepreneurs impact most is by generating jobs yes. and avoiding great talent to be just wasted exactly. and get unemployed. Correct. So it's funny. And James, I'll give you a voucher of t 30 ringgit for your. You girlfriend. can give your girlfriend or your scandal yeah, or the your scandal or whatever. Yeah, yeah. your flirting, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or for yourself, I don't know. Oh, don't worry, we have drag queens as so well who buy okay, our products. Don't share that in public. Okay, next question. 10 second rule. Ask anything, don't worry. There you come. Oh. Come here. All the guys have to be uh, So, first off, congratulations. I've actually been to your store with a friend. Not for myself. <laughs> and, no, and your we, we, we are, are not here to judge. Yeah. <laughs> your designs are, even for a guy, really beautiful. Um, I'm just curious. So, so you spoke a lot about uh, relationships and people giving you a break. I'm just curious. What happened to that guy who gave you your first break? And you know, um, are you still in good terms with him? <laughs> uh, you mean the the factory? Yeah, the the one that gave you your, your first break. We still we still outsource certain 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 jobs to them. Yeah. So uh, maybe to elaborate on that, um, maybe you can share some stories about how you build your relationships with your suppliers over time. So you know, because if, if they can't scale production or you can't scale relationship, you can't scale your business. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay, I hate to be very straightforward. Okay, but reality reality is harsh, harsh la, Okay, it's a doggy dog world. No, if I'm going to say like a very beautiful story, I'm I'm I'm, I'm bluffing you la. Sometimes we start off with certain people and sometimes we outgrow our partners. Of course it's good, I mean a very idealistic situation, ah, okay? We grow together. My company grows, your company grows. We grow together and we be big together. I mean, this is very idealistic, but in the real world, sometimes you have to make hard decisions. Like uh, I have, I uh, throughout the years, I have had certain suppliers who are like, Seriously, I sleep on the, can stay in my house, sit on, the, sleep on the same sofa. You know, can like very best friend, best friend, best friend, best friend. Yes, and the relationship is so personal. But you know, after a while, sometimes um, the person cannot deliver to your requirement. Maybe you're growing at a really fast pace, and the other person is not growing as fast as you. You need to make hard decisions. Either you ditch that person. I know it sounds very bad, but. I usually, what I do is, uh, I try my best not to to break any relationships unless I really, really have to. Because anybody who tell you that it's all fine and dandy and then they have no enemies, not to say enemies, uh, but like, they cut off some suppliers and stuff like that, they are lying to you. Like, they're always things that, you know, just the things that don't work out. What I do is, I try not to depend on one human too much because humans are humans. Sometimes they disappoint. You know, even your best friend or your spouse or your boyfriend can disappoint you at one point of life, at, at one point of time. So I try to spread my risk. Um, like that guy which I gave me my first chance, he's still with me, he and the wife, okay? Um, but because they could not cater to my growing demands, I'm still using them, but I also have my own line my own production line and some backup. But this is very, very civil. I tell them, okay, I'm not only using you, I have I have to keep my, I, you cannot cater, I, I need 1,000 pairs a week and you, are, you, cannot, you only can make 200 pairs a week. So the 800 pairs have to come from somewhere. So I will figure that out. You, because I know some people, they, they're not interested in, not to say they're not interested in scaling their business, but sometimes they're old, they don't have the drive, they, they feel like, okay, 200 pairs a week, enough already. But, you know, so I what I do is, what they can't do, I look elsewhere. I look elsewhere, like other suppliers or other people who can satisfy that need. You know, if I try my best not to cut them off unless they really, really, really cannot. You know, really, really cannot even make because at the end of the day, uh, we want to give the best product to our customer. So the day that they f they cannot their their visions the vision is not in line with my vision then i have to make the call the hard call to switch supplier or switch factory or sack the staff or i mean i've got rid of people before 
you know uh, I, I know everybody is very idealistic because you just started your business you know you, you your team is still with you from day one oh we're best friends we started together sometimes people have a change of heart or a change of vision you you guys don't brief the same don't speak the same language anymore so it's like a divorce uh, it happens yeah. hmm. okay last question girl yes <laughs> Um, so I'm a fresh, thank you, but I'm a fresh graduate and um, like you said, you didn't have any like experience, prior experience in business, so how did you do it? Is it all like based on experience or did you went back to study and, and things like that? Uh, I studied uh, biotechnology, the only thing I studied was those microscope and plant and then all the flies made together and get different flies, that's what I learned in school, okay, Can I, uh, I didn't learn anything, I mean, School. I mean, uh, what I study in school totally different. <laughs> Not nothing is used. You know, when I, when I was in school, nobody. Did, my lecturer. We don't even. I, I have PowerPoint. Got learn in school. Got got uh, during varsity to present to the lecturer. But everything else, um, I learned uh, from the school of hard knocks uh, by making mistakes, learning from people. Uh, that's why I think uh, when you just graduate uh, and you're still young and your brain like not condemned yet right like still can absorb like a sponge learn as many things as you can and learn random things because i realize when you learn random things uh, you'll find a use for them one day uh, learn from friends always try to mix with people who are elder than you um, people who do different things from you different fields different different profession mix with your parent uh, your auntie uh, like neighbors people around you and try to learn from them because there's no even if you go to business school, uh, I tell you all those people who do MBA when I come out, uh, I don't know if you, not, not, it's not guaranteed that you'll, you will have a successful business if you, you do a PhD in business. It doesn't, because that's academic, this is the real, real thing. Um, you'll make mistakes, don't be afraid, just keep making mistakes. Just make sure your bank got some money in case anything happened, you can like survive. But just be brave, uh. you've got to like suck it up and just simply, like, you know, but. <laughs> Okay, to that throne.